Thank you for joining us for this evening's event. My name is Jeremy Garber, and I'm the events coordinator for PALS Books. Before we begin, I wanted to encourage you to check out our lineup of upcoming virtual events by visiting our website at pals.com. One of the many great events we're looking forward to is Steve Olson in conversation with Tom Carpenter, which takes place next Monday, August 3rd. Uh, they join us to talk about Olson's new book, The Apocalypse Factory, Plutonium and the Making of the Atomic Age. Please consider following us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram as well if you haven't already done so. Please sign up for our weekly events email at pals.com. Tonight, we're honored to welcome John Perkins and David Corton. John Perkins is an author and activist whose 10 books on global intrigue, shamanism, and transformation, including Touching the Jaguar, Shapeshifting, and the classic Confessions of an Economic Hitman, have been on the New York Times bestsellers list for more than 70 weeks, sold over 2 million copies, and are published in 35 languages. As chief economist at a major consulting firm, he advised the World Bank, United Nations, Fortune 500 corporations, US and other governments. He regularly speaks at universities, economic forums, and shamanic gatherings around the world, and is a founder and board member of the nonprofit organizations Pachamama Alliance and Dream Change. What can you do to make the world a better place and create a more satisfying life for yourself? In his new book, Touching the Jaguar, transforming fear into action to change your life, Perkins invites us to answer that question. Perkins details how shamanism converted him from an economic hitman to a crusader for transforming a failing death economy, exploiting resources that are declining at accelerating rates, into a life economy, cleaning up pollution, recycling, and developing resource regenerative technologies. He describes the power our perceptions have for molding reality, both individually and globally, and he provides a strategy for each of us to change our lives and defend our territory, the earth, against current destructive policies and systems. Perkins is joined in conversation tonight by David Corton. Corton is co-founder of Yes Magazine, president of the Living Economies Forum, and a member of the Club of Rome. He writes a regular column for Yes and is the author of numerous books, including Change the Story, Change the Future, A Living Economy for a Living Earth, Agenda for a New Economy, from phantom wealth to real wealth, and the international bestseller, When Corporations Rule the World. He holds MBA and PhD degrees from the Stanford Business School, has served as a Harvard Business School professor, and has 30 years of experience as a development professional in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. This evening's event will also include an audience Q&A. Please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen if you'd like to ask a question. As well, if someone has typed a question you'd also like to know the answer to, please consider upvoting that particular question by clicking the thumbs up button. Most importantly, please consider supporting both John, David, and Pals by purchasing a copy of his new book, Touching the Jaguar. A link to buy the book will be shared in the chat a couple times this evening. John, David, it's an honor to welcome you both, and thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Jeremy, for inviting us both and and I just want to mention that I've got this baby jaguar here with me too that I'm that I'm touching she's actually an American tabby kitten of about three months old <laughs> she may be running around in the process but uh, thank you and David I just I'll, I'll turn this over to you at this point uh, it's great to have you it's great to be with you again I love I love hanging out with you David well this uh, social distancing doesn't work out so well given we used to have lunches every <laughs> every couple of weeks as neighbors here. Um, yeah, just kind of by way of introducing our relationship, um, you know, John and I both have devoted much of our lives to the work of foreign aid, presumably to lift the poor from poverty. But we both ultimately learned that foreign aid is practiced as about advancing the interests of the rich, not the poor. And we're now both devoting our lives to, in our own ways, to exposing the reality of the deep corruption and to advancing the essential transformation of the system that actually is currently not working for anyone. Now, it's, it's interesting as we look back on this that John and I worked in actually rather different parts of the foreign aid system. Uh, the part I was in maintained probably a stronger facade of aiding the poor. But ultimately, I learned that my piece of the system 
was mainly covered for John's piece of the system, which is where the, uh, the kind of open corruption took place. Now, my introduction to John came in December of 2003 when I re received a quest from Barrett Kohler, who's the publisher of, of uh, the original publisher of Confessions and of his current book. And Barrett Kohler asked me to receive, to, to review a manuscript for Confessions. And I was totally pulled into it. I was enthralled by his story revealing the dark side of the foreign aid establishment that I was beginning to, <laughs> to fully recognize. And his role in reestablishing the colonization of people that supposedly, you know, of, of the world's poor that supposedly ended with World War II. And, but as I looked at it, I, I sent the following report to Barrett Kohler. I said, I started reading and I cannot put it down, but my main concern it is, it is that it's too good. It reads as if it was written by a master novelist, not a first time author who spent his life doing evil deeds. <laughs> That's a quote from what I sent to Barrett Kohler. So I urged them to do a very careful check on his authenticity. <laughs> they, they did the check and it held up. And then John subsequently moved with his family from Florida to Bainbridge Island in Washington State where I live. And we've since become close friends and colleagues. Um, and John is just a phenomenal storyteller. And so far as I can tell, he's also authentic. And Touching the Jaguar is a compelling read dealing with profoundly deep and timely issues. And in this time of need for deep examination of systemic racism, exclusion, and institutional dysfunction, it's a story about people so unlike ourselves, and yet in so many ways so similar. It's a story of a people that modern society seems intent on extinguishing Yet in that story, we can see with ever greater clarity <clears throat> the devastation that we inflict on ourselves on an increasingly clear and unified human path to self-extinction. So I highly recommend this book as part of our study and understanding of why we are on this current disastrous course and what we have to learn from all the varied people of the world, but particularly indigenous people and from John's book, the people of the, of the Amazon. So with that, uh, John, I'd like to turn back to you uh, with this question. What is the main theme of touching the Jaguar? And why did you write it at this time in history? And how does it differ from your previous books? Thank you, David. And, and yeah, <laughs> yeah, boy, I tell you, that first uh, review you wrote of Con Confessions of Nick on the Kip, and I just kind of wanted to rip it up and throw it out because it, it was right on. <laughs> and I wasn't sure I wanted to, well, I wanted to do all the work that was going to be required to make some of the changes you suggested, but it was such a big help. And I want to really thank Powell's also for having us on this. And I've always been a huge fan of Powell's and the independent bookstores, and I'm so grateful to, to to, for Paul to have us on this, although I miss being there in person. Um, so the, the main theme I, I think we can sum up is saying that um, our human reality is determined by human perceptions. And that's something that I learned from a shaman in the Amazon back in 1969 when I was, I was dying. Uh, and the shaman cured me by teaching me that. And then afterwards I came to understand that that's the basis of shamanism around the world. And it's also the basis of modern psychotherapy, of quantum physics, of government, of marketing, of public relations, of corporations, of the economy. And it's what I use as an economic hitman. I was selling perceptions to people to get them to do things I wanted them to do. And so what we've, today we, we understand that we have created a world that's, that's really falling apart. We've created an economic system, as, as Jeremy mentioned at the beginning, the, we could, what some of us call a life economy. Uh, and, and we've created a death economy, an economic system that's, uh, that's consuming itself into extinction, basically. And it's driven by the perception, the sole perception, that the goal of business 
is to maximize short-term profits regardless of the social and environmental costs. And it's, that's a very lousy goal to have for businesses. And it's contrary to the way human beings have lived throughout most of our history until fairly recently. So we need to turn that around and create what we could call a life economy, which cleans up pollution, regenerates destroyed environments, is itself a renewable resource, creates new technologies that are renewable. And all that takes is a change of perception uh, from uh, focusing on short-term profits to focusing on long-term maximization of benefits for people and nature. All it takes is that change of perception. And then it'll cost a lot of work to do, get, to get the actions in place to make that happen. But so the theme really is that our perceptions drive our reality. And that's and every one of us as individuals and as, as communities, we have a role to play in this. And if there's one thing I want to leave, re, leave the readers of the, this book with, it's, you know, you have a role to play in this and it's exciting. And this is a wonderful time to be alive uh, when we can move into this new perception of what it means to be human on this planet. And I wrote the book, David, in answer to your second question there, why this book at this time? Well, obviously when I wrote it, I didn't know we were gonna have the pandemic. I didn't know there was gonna be all this, uh, all the issues around racism and police brutality and, and, and white superiority or white, white uh, privilege. You know, the, these ideas that, that there's a superior race and, and it's privilege. All of this stuff, I had no idea this was gonna be coming to a head at the time the book came out. But I did know that we were experiencing once in 100 year events every year or so, the big hurricanes, the earthquakes, uh, the fires in Florida and Australia and so forth. And, and I knew that that was being caused by this death economy. Ultimately, it is the disease behind all these other things that are really symptoms. And that's created by a perception. And what it takes is for us to change that perception. And as it turns out, this book is perfect for these times because it addresses how we move beyond COVID-19, how we move beyond the pandemic, how we, how we really deal uh, with racial injustice by changing, by, by, by really looking at our perceptions. And the other way, reason I wrote the book is because I'd written five books on shamanism and indigenous people, shape-shifting the world as, as you dream and others and four books on global economics, including Confessions of an Economic Hitman, Hoodwink, The Secret History of the American Empire. And this book is really the bridge between those seemingly two disparate, separate genres, which to me, there's always been this connection because it's the connection of perception molding reality. But there was never an overt connection made. And so I thought it was time to actually bring these two genres together. And that's a, that I, so this book was my, uh, my attempt to build a bridge between these genres. Wow, very <laughs> good answer. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it is totally amazing how the, the extent to which we have uh, aligned around a very similar framework. Um, now, I've spent a good deal of my time in Asia, actually 15 years living in Southeast Asia. And one of the things that really struck me out of that was the extent to which more traditional Eastern cultures, um, their primary frame is a frame of community and became very conscious of the, the distinction between our Western individualism and the, the, the whole mental frame, as, as you most very accurately describe it, of, um, of more Eastern cultures. And all of this ties in with your, your fundamental observation that, that, that we are a species of the mind. Uh, in a sense, we create a reality in our minds. And it's, 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 it's absolutely fundamental to recognize that our institutions of, of money, of corporations, of government, and so forth, basically have no existence outside of the human mind. They are mental constructs that we live within. And what we're recognizing now is that we've, we've got to get out of those, uh, those constructs and a very, get into a very different set of constructs. And foundational to this is the recognition that as beings, <laughs> 
uh, you know, we've come to define ourselves as financial beings about making money, uh, where in fact we are living beings. And at a deeper level, science is beginning to recognize that um, life, in fact, exists, if you really understand it, can only exist in communities that self-organize to create and maintain the conditions essential to their own existence. And it so struck me as I was rereading uh, your book um, that the significance of community to these Amazonian people and the many ways in which they have learned to live and exist in community in ways that very often in our Western uh, communities we, we ignore or miss. And I'm wondering what, what you could share with us from your experience about what, what you've learned about living in community from these people. Um, and what, what is there in that experience that may be helpful to us as, <clears throat> as we try to get a better handle on what we need to do as a, as a society, if we're going to have a, a common future, yeah. Well, it's a it's a basic question, and it once once again, it goes to this idea of perception. So, uh, you know, we we in the United States and and in much of what we'd call Western culture have such a strong influence on on the individual, and you know, we have this philosophical background that goes back maybe three four hundred years. Uh, that really focuses on on the importance of the individual, and I happen to have grown up in the state of New Hampshire, which the motto of that state is "Live free or die." You know, it's very very individualized. Uh, it actually came out of the Vietnam War sort of thing, but it, it, it's this whole idea. But yeah, we go back to this this individualized idea, and in indigenous cultures that I've lived with, and. I, I want to say I don't idealize in individuals in, indi in indigenous cultures. I, I want to make it clear that there, 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 are, there are brutal people and there are gentle people. There are incredibly wise people and there are crazy people amongst indigenous. But I do, I, what I do idealize, what I do respect is their view of the long term, this idea that they live in a life economy. You know, it's not about short term gain, it's about long term, and it is about the community. So although I may pride myself as a wonderful builder of dugout canoes, and it, my neighbor may pride himself as a wonderful uh, builder of, of blow guns, and, 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 and my, my wife might pride herself on the kind of, they, they make a kind of beer that women make called chicha because they don't want to drink the river water because they know it's polluted with organic material. May pride herself on the chicha she makes. It's, it's all, it, we pride ourselves on, on these individual talents that we have, but it's all directed toward the community. It is not directed toward maximizing our own personal gain. In fact, you know, it's, 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 it, they give things away constantly. They, they, don't, they don't accumulate, you know, you, you trade things because it's fun to trade and you may need things in the short term, but you, you like to just keep, keep things circulating. And, and, and it's, it's interesting to go into an indigenous home that you may have been going into for 30 or 40 years as I have, and, and you may have been giving them flashlights now once in a while, and maybe even a watch or something sometimes as a trading on it. They don't have them anymore. They just let them go. They pass them on because they don't, they, they're just not into that. It's about living, it's about life. And, and I think it's about being in the community. It's about sharing. It's about the way you bring up your children and, and the, the way your children relate to other children. It's a beautiful experience. And I, I think there's a, been a movement in, in the United States back toward that in some respects. We see you know, the emphasis on local, Dave, you've written a lot about the importance of local co-ops, local banks, uh, you know, community markets, farmers markets, things like that. So I think we've been making a movement back toward that, which may have been somewhat disturbed by the coronavirus. On the other hand, we've been developing a whole new sense of community, I think virtually, and I'm not sure the implications of that. But, be, but without getting into that in a lot of detail, one of the really interesting aspects of what's happened, and I talk about in the book extensively, so as you know, the book is written as a narrative nonfiction. I like to write stories, because I think people love stories rather than just di didactics. That's and, why it's so captivating. <laughs> yeah, well, I hope they're fun stories and exciting they stories. Are. They're all true stories, of course. 
but throughout they're about life death and money i mean man it's <laughs> <laughs> sex death and rock and roll you know yeah. I mean, yeah. uh, and, and uh and you know the one of the stories that that kind of runs throughout is the formation of the Pachamama Alliance, which I'm one of the founders of, but and how that related to the indigenous people in the Amazon that invited us. And I think that story tells so much about community because through, when I was first living with the Schwa people back in the late 60s, they saw the Achwa as their enemies and the, and, and the Quechua and, and, the, and the Sapara and, and, and the Waranis and other communities as their enemies. You can probably hear my Jaguar screaming in the background here. They saw these people as their enemies because they were hunters and gatherers. And they, they felt they had to protect their territory. It's, hunters and gatherers need a large territory with lots of game. And if somebody's encroaching on it, they keep them out. So there were these battles. They weren't so much wars as battles with their neighbors. And then, about the time I was a Peace Corps volunteer, late 60s, Texaco, came into this area of the Amazon drilling for oil. And suddenly these people realized that they had to change their perception in order to change their reality. The reality was now threatened by an American oil company and big, big time threat, much bigger than these little skirmishes on the border. And so they realized that the real enemy was not their neighbors. It was foreign corporations exploiting the resources in devastating ways. And so they joined together and they formed federations to keep out the oil companies. And then they realized something really, really amazing. It expressed such tremendous wisdom. They realized that the threat was not really the oil companies or the mining companies. It was the, what they call the dream behind those companies, the perception of the modern world that, that thought it need that thinks it needs oil and minerals from from all over in order to increase its economic its death economy they saw this and so they realized that the real enemy was not the oil companies it was us the people of the modern world and they had to change their perception now to, to actually embrace us so their idea touching the jaguar to them they would define as meaning you identify your fears and then instead of running from your fears you go out and you touch your fears, you confront them, you, you address your fears. And once you do that, your perception changes in ways that allow you to take new actions to move forward the way you want to move forward. So they changed their perception from being fearful of us to realize, well, they still were fearful of us, but to realize that they needed to join with us. They needed to create a partnership, which they asked me to do, which became the Pachamama Alliance that would help them reach out and change the dream of the modern world throughout the, the world, which is what the Pachamama Alliance is all about. It's about protecting the rainforest, but in the process, changing the dream. We're in something like 87 countries now with dream-changing programs. So it was really a phenomenal transition that these people made from, being, from enemies that they had been, had been enemies with for thousands of years to embracing these enemies to form federations to keep the oil companies out, to then realizing that they had to form a partnership, a federation, an alliance with the people from the countries where the oil companies, where the oil was going, and change the dream of that world. In essence, help us transform a death economy to a life economy. And that's been, that's been their goal. And as a result, in a very short period of time, they've, they've had their ambassadors traveling around the world, speaking at conferences all over and having a huge impact. It's really quite an amazing story. That's totally fascinating, John. And, uh, you know, it gets so into, the, the, you know, this defining theme of my work about corporations. And it's fascinating in terms of language that most of these corporations refer to themselves as multinational which implies that they are national or local everywhere, which of course is just another one of these big lies. And what's so fascinating about what you describe about what the indigenous people of the, uh, of the Amazon figured out is, is basically what we need to figure out now, that these same corporations that are destroying them supposedly <laughs> representing us 
do not in fact represent us and they do not represent our interests. Uh, they represent the interests of a very few of us who are among the predatory <laughs> billionaire class, which by which I mean not all billionaires are necessarily predatory, but many of them are. And we have to, you know, par part of our problem and our, our goal, our, uh, our, our challenge in mobilizing is to recognize that these corporations in their mindless pursuit of, of money without taking into account the consequences for people and earth are, uh, are basically enemies of all of us. Um, and this then becomes the foundation of our alliance through groups like the Pachamama Alliance, our alliance with the people of the Amazon to stand up to and, and, and face these institutions. Now, there's another piece of this that I'd love to get your, your thoughts on. Now, your work as an economic hitman was about going to world leaders and convincing them to take out big international loans uh, that they had no hope of paying back, but which the debts would not fall on the leaders. In fact, I don't know that you say this, but I, I have been told by other colleagues that uh, were involved in, in negotiating or formalizing these loans, that very often the World Bank loans uh, involved an assumption that 10% of the proceeds would go to paying bribes and, and paying corruption for the, uh, the local leaders who, who accepted them. Um, and then those unpayable debts set up the framework so the debt collectors could come in and transform economies, all to shift more power to the to the very wealthy at the expense of the, of the very poor. Now, as, <laughs> as we look at our current situation playing out all throughout the world, including in the United States, um, a basic characteristic of our economy is massive indebtedness, uh, student debt, consumer debt, aspect of debt after debt, uh, such an increasing numbers uh, percentage of the population is just scrambling to, you know, not only to live day by day, but at the same time to uh, pay off the debts so that they yeah. don't lose whatever small assets they actually have. So the question is, what, what did you, what have you learned from your experience being right at the heart of that system, creating that problem? and then recognizing how flawed that is, changing your allegiance. What, what are the lessons for, for us as well as for the uh, people of the Amazon regarding debt? Well, I think we, we, we can see that debt is just another part of this, the perception of this uh, death economy. Uh, it, it, it's a, debt, debt is really a way of enslaving people. Uh, and this isn't to in any way <laughs> suggest that it's, it is equivalent to dragging people away from their homes and putting them in chains, that that type of slavery, it's, it's, it's not that, but it, it is a very, very deep form of debt. And when you're in deep debt, you don't really resist the system. You're not likely to, you're not likely to rock the boat, so to speak, because you, don't, you, you just want to get rid of the debt. You want to be able to feed your family. You want to be able to take care of things. And unfortunately, you tend to get deeper into debt. Uh, talking to a young woman recently who had just graduated from uh, from law school, and she said, "You know, I went to law school in order to uh, do what I really want to do, which is to help uh, uh, poor people and and the environment. And I want to do a lot of pro bono pro, pro, pro bono work uh, in those areas. But I owe two hundred fifty thousand dollars in education debt. I'm going to have to go to work for a big corporation, a big law firm in order to pay off my debt. But I can probably do that in, in five years or so, and then I'll be free of the debt and I can do what I want to do. And, you know, I had to say to her, look, be careful, because more than, what's more than likely is that you'll, you'll find a, a lover, you'll, you'll, you'll fall in love, uh, you may want to start a family, you buy a house, buy a car, get deeper and deeper into debt. And, 
uh, just be be careful. Just be really careful because that's what the system does. It it puts us in debt. And I certainly experienced that myself as an economic hitman. It wasn't just debt. It was the moneyed economy. The idea that the American dream is that you make more and more and more money. And so there's this perception there that that we have this. And I think you know each of us as as individuals, we 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 have you know beyond all the debt. How do we move forward and, and, and really change our lives in the world? And that's, you know, that's the subtitle of the book, uh, Transforming Fear into Action to Change Your Life in the World. I, I just have this right here in front of me. I love this. You know, there's that Jaguar on there <laughs> yeah. in the subtitle, Transforming Fear into Action to Change Your Life in the World. And in the book, I, you know, the, the, at, at the end of the book, after all the stories and so forth, I go into uh, this a daily practice that everybody can, can, can practice for less than 10 minutes a day, or you could do it once a week, it doesn't have to be every day. And it's based on these five questions that I, I and I'm gonna give you an example that I think will help to answer some of these questions because it also gets into the community service. So the first question is, what do I wanna do for the rest of my life? What will give me the greatest satisfaction? And I would answer that, I like to write. I want to write for the rest of my life. I love to write. I enjoy writing. I have a good friend who's a carpenter. He would say, I like to work with my hands in wood, kind of the opposite of a writer. I want to do that for the rest of my life. The second question, how do I use what I most want to do with my life to serve my community? And the community could be one other person or it could be the whole world, but we're all happier when we're helping others. There's no question about that. We're happier when we help others. I would answer that question by saying, I want to write stories that'll inspire people to change their lives in the world. My carpenter friend would say, I want to do carpentry with sustainable materials. The third question then is, what's holding me back from doing this? What's the jaguar that's keeping me from moving forward? And as a writer, I might say, oh, I just don't have enough time to write. And my carpenter friend, might say, oh, well, my clients don't want to pay the extra, co the extra price for sustainable materials. And so the fourth question is, when we touch that Jaguar, how do our perceptions, perceptions change in a way to let us move forward? Well, I could touch my Jaguar and say, hey, I could get up half an hour earlier every morning and write, or I could watch an hour or less of television at night and write every night, or maybe three nights a week. And my carpenter friend would say, when he touches that Jaguar, the Jaguar says, hey, tell your clients that the extra price of sustainable materials is not a cost. It's an investment, an investment in the future for themselves, their children, and their grandchildren. And then the fifth question, what actions do I take? Well, as a writer, I got to write every day or almost every day. A carpenter, you know, so he goes out and he builds a cabinet or he builds a house using sustainable materials and he tells, he tells the children, hey, your parents paid a little bit more for, <laughs> for this Jaguar. Your, your, parents, your parents paid a little bit more to, to get used to sustainable materials to build this, this cabinet or this house, but it's an investment in your future just like education or something else might be an education in your future. And so I think if we, if we all, every individual, whether you're a teacher, a writer, you know, a, a plumber, a carpenter, a, a parent, whatever you are, you can, you can ask yourself these five questions. What will give me the most satisfaction in life? How do I relate that to the larger community? Uh, what's stopping me from doing it? And how do I change my perceptions in a way? How do I touch the Jaguar so that I can move forward with this? And what actions do I take? And then in the book describes a daily practice that makes it really easy to do that. And to recognize that those last three questions are probably gonna change. Uh, maybe every day, but periodically. What's holding, you know, what, what, you know, what, what, what's, what, what's holding me back? How do I change my perception? What actions do I take? So as a writer, you know, I, so all right, so I've now created time to write. I've, I've figured that out. But now the next question is, well, what am I going to write about? <laughs> you know? And then the next question beyond that might be, how do I write the first sentence? And so on. But every time we answer those questions, we move forward. We rise to another level of consciousness and another level of satisfaction and another level of self-perception. 
And so I think, you know, and, and all of it is aimed not at, it's, 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 it, is that, it is that subtitle of the book, Transforming Fear, because we fear change. We fear doing these things, transforming fear into actions to change your life and the world. So all of this is tied to that question of yours about community. How do we, how do we, you know, how do we do this in a way that brings in the community? And that is not what I was taught in business school, and, and you weren't either, I don't think. Uh, that, you know, it was not about serving the community. Well, it was about serving the community of investors. It was about serving your very small community. So your community was defined as the people who you want to make a lot of money for, short-term profits. But now we're looking at a bigger community. We're understanding that the glaciers are melting and the oceans are rising and species are going extinct. And we, we've created this economic system that's failing us and we need to turn it around. And I'll, I'll turn it back to you, David. I'd also mention to, to, to the listeners that we're, uh, in another uh, five minutes or so, we'll be taking questions from, from the audience. So if you wanna start sending questions in on the chat line, please uh, go ahead and do that now. Back to you, Dave. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's fascinating listening to you. Actually, one thing I, I will mention is that I went to business school so long ago um, th that it was actually before we moved to the era in which it was assumed that the purpose of business was to maximize profits for its richest shareholders. Yeah. Um, so there, there That's were... very telling. <laughs> That's very telling. <laughs> That all changed in 76 when Milton Friedman won the Nobel Prize in economics and said the only responsibility of business is to maximize short-term profits. That is absolutely right. You know, the, 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 the idea had been growing, but Friedman really put the nail in the, in the coffin on that yeah. one. Well, this is why I would uh, strongly advise if uh, you know any young person who is uh, planning to sign up for economics, to study economics, that you urge them to avoid that brain damage. <laughs> um, but, you know, what, what really struck me in, in what you just said is I, I never heard you ask, what can I do to make the most money? Nor did I ever hear you ask, how can I avoid doing any labor? Because, you know, labor is bad. I want to, you know, ha ha have money effortlessly, which is the, um, the, the holy grail currently of our economic system, you know, be a, be a financial speculator and find ways to maximize profit producing nothing of value. Yeah, except I did mention the carpenter, you know, and, and I know a lot of people like that that love to labor, love to work with their hands, love to do that. I've got, you know, a number of good Exactly. Jobs. Well, this is, this is part of, you know, what you're saying, understanding ourselves, our, our real human nature, that, you know, we need to feel useful. We get our greatest satisfaction from feeling that we are contributing to the community, that we are making life better, even though we're, you know, taking care of our pets and we're tending our garden. Um, and there's nothing more boring or unedifying to, to, to sit around with absolutely nothing to do. It's one reason some of us go a little stir crazy uh, during the uh, pandemic. Um, but it's all part of this reconceptualization of, of recognizing that a, a really suitable productive economy should be one in which we each have a maximum opportunity to contribute, to feel satisfaction in our contribution, and to be able to contribute in ways that in turn satisfy our means for a, our, our, our need for a means of living. Mm. So I wonder, do you, do you have any other thoughts you want to share on, you know, before we go into, uh, to, to, to questions from the, from the audience yeah. um, about your advice to, uh, uh, to, to young people or, or people who are trying to get their lives sorted out, particularly within, you know, within the existing situation of, of finding ways that we can live that are deeply satisfying and that also are a means of making our living. I think, yeah, I think this is an amazing time to be alive, really. And, and, and I'm not discounting in any way that, that the pain, that the suffering, that the, the deaths that have occurred during this time and, and the turmoil over um, 
overall the racial inequalities and the income inequalities. But I think we're going through this period of incredible transition. And, and this, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, one of the things that people fear most, I think, is change. And this time, these last few months have taught us that we all have to change and we can change. And it's been hard for a lot of people. It's been difficult. People resist it, but we are changing. And I, I think as, as we, uh, you know, we look around the world and I have had the great opportunity in the last years since Confessions came out to, to travel around the world, as I know you have, and, and speaking on these things. And everywhere we go, we, we see that people are waking up to the fact we live on a very tiny space station, the Earth. And we humans are the pilots. We've been navigating our space station toward disaster. And I think people, though, are really waking up to that fact and that we, we need to reboot the navigation system. And each of us, each of us has a role to play in this. It's a very, very exciting time moving into a life economy, an economic system that pays people to clean up pollution, to, to come up with techniques for, and pays corporations to come up with techniques for mining all the plastic that's floating around in the oceans or cleaning up all the gas, the oil that's leaked around gas stations and, and, and oil drilling rigs and fill in old strip mines, regenerate the, the destroyed environment, come up with you know, techniques that are gonna to make today's solar and, and wind look, look look ancient in five years, hopefully, that we'll be moving way beyond that, that we'll be moving into a truly regenerative economic system. I, I think this is such an exciting time, and I, I, and I believe this coronavirus has pushed us there. These once in 100 year events, we've seen them as local. They haven't been local, but we've seen them. So if I survive a hurricane, I expect the outside world to come to my rescue soon, bring me bottled water and food, and, and then I'm gonna rebuild, you know? But, but now we've, we've been, everybody on the planet, including deep in the Amazon, my friends deep in the Amazon have been hit by this virus. And we've all been hit and we've all had to come together to realize that we've got this common, um, I don't even like to think of it as an enemy. We've got this common driving force, this common motivating force to, to, to get us to change. And we've seen that we can change. The fact you and I are not at Powell's in Portland, Oregon. And this, I don't know, there's, a, there's a 50 people or so listening to this. Some of them may be overseas. They, they're probably not all in Portland. But if we were speaking in Portland, they'd probably all just have come from a fairly close neighborhood. And we can have meetings with people across the planet without flying. And we've really understood the incredible opportunity here for change. We don't need to fear change. We do fear it, but we can move beyond that. We can touch that fear. We can go out and say, what's it do for me? I'm stuck here at home. I'm stressed out. I don't know if I can take another day self-isolating, forget about another month or two months or three, whatever it's going to be. Ah, but when I touch that Jaguar, it says, didn't you always want to learn to play the flute? You have a flute. You can learn to play it on the internet. Didn't you always want to write a book? <laughs> Here's your opportunity. Didn't you always want to read more books? Didn't you want to communicate on the telephone or FaceTime or whatever with your, with your family that's in another country? We can see the opportunities that arise. So yeah, the, I'd like to leave you know, this formal part of our, our presentation with the idea that we live in blessed times. And we people should feel very fortunate to be alive now, I think, despite the challenges, despite the problems, human beings have always faced problems. You know, our parents faced the world wars and depressions and so on and so forth. And now we're facing something that's really has the opportunity to bring us together to realize that we can rise to a higher consciousness of what it means to be human beings on this planet. And we can each do it in our own way. So for young people, follow your path, follow your heart, you know, don't feel that you've got to go this route or you've got to go that route. Really ask yourself, what do I want to do for the rest of my life? Young people and people my age can ask that question. What do I want to do for the rest of my life? What's keeping me from doing it? What happens when I confront that fear? And, and how do I take the action? How do I change my perception and then take the actions? I think this is a marvelous time to be alive, David, and, and I'm, I'm grateful for it. And I, I think we should all feel that the opportunities here are for tremendous change. And I think we should turn it over to Jeremy now at Powell's Bookstore to, to see what kind of questions we get coming in. Jeremy, are you there? There you are. Yeah, thanks, gentlemen. Uh, the first question comes from Anton. He, he would like your comments on the following expansion of fossil fuel investment. And that's a quote from a Guardian article from late last year. 
The world's largest investment banks have provided more than $700 billion of financing for the fossil fuel companies, most aggressively expanding in new coal, oil and gas projects since the Paris Climate Change Agreement figures show. So he's asking for your comments on that expansion. Well, yeah, it's, David, that's really good. That, I think that's something that you'd like to answer and I, I'd be happy to add to it, but why don't you start? Well, it's all, it's, <laughs> It's all part of the process that we've got to go through, and it's uh, you know we've got we've got all these these financial institutions that they're in the business of manipulating the financial system to maximize their own returns to their financial speculators, their, um, and you know controlling things like the uh, the uh, retirement funds of. Of, of retirees so that they can leverage those to uh, control and advance advance exactly these uh, investments that are destroying Earth's capacity to support life and therefore destroying our <laughs> the, the future that our own children depend on. Um, so this is all part of the fundamental rethinking in the deepest way. Now, um, there are so many things going on in the finance world about what what these companies are financing and whatnot that it's it's very hard to respond to that specific instance because I don't know the details. But uh, well, 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 I would just add, I think you know we've seen BlackRock, a big huge yeah. investment firm, uh, draw out of that. We've seen a, a number of foundations say they will no longer invest in these things. I think actually even before the, before the coronavirus happened, we were seeing a move toward a life economy. We're seeing B corporations, benefit corporations, the Green New Deal, conscious capitalism. We even saw, you know, 180 some odd uh, CEOs from some of the most powerful companies in the world at the business roundtable last August come up with a statement that it, it could no longer be about maximizing short-term profits, that you needed to take account of other stakeholders, including their employees and their the communities where they work. Basically, they're talking about going into a life economy. So are they doing it? Well, we've, we, the, we, the consumer, the investor, and the employee have to push them to do that. But they've, they've offered that change of perception. That's the first step, you know, it's, it, it, whether they, you know, they gotta assume that they meant it, can they do it? They need us to push them to do it. And, and I, I think that's happening. I think we are seeing, and we're seeing some, some of the big investment firms, and I think even some of the banks, uh, really saying that they don't want to invest in fossil fuels anymore. We yeah, need- You gotta be, be real careful because a lot of that is, uh, <laughs> is, is distortion and misrepresentation. I mean, do be clear that most of the B corporations are not publicly traded companies. They're companies that are owned by uh, you know, they're owned by cooperative owners or they are owned by individuals that, that have a, a commitment to, uh, to business responsibility beyond profit. Um, and BlackRock is, uh, there's reason to be very suspicious about, uh, about what they're doing and the games they play. But at the same time, you're absolutely right. These, uh, these players that have been totally predatory are, are gradually realizing that whether their values have actually changed or not, that they're losing credibility fast. And they're, so they're, <laughs> there's a lot of opening for conversation. It, yeah, and perception, you know, it, it, it takes us, I have a friend mentioned in the book who, uh, in order to impress her neighbors that she was a good environmentalist, she lived in California where it's, the sun's out a lot, she, she stopped using her dryer for her clothes and she hung them out on a line for all the neighbors to see how she was being a good environmentalist. And, and it was, it, you know, it was, it was greenwashing. But then because she did, took that first step, she, it, it just changed her life actually. And mm -hmm. she's now a leader in developing programs uh, for environmental sustainability. And I think, you know, we can see that maybe a, a Walmart, when they first bring in organic foods and local foods and so forth, maybe it's done for public relations, but that begins to have an effect. And maybe BlackRock, yes, maybe we should be suspicious, but once they get started, that gets things started. And so, I, I, you know, perception is so powerful that when we start making these changes, things happen and and so i'm encouraged by these things at the same time i know we need to push i can't tell you how many ceos 
have told me or, or over time, hey, I want my company to be greener. I have children, I have grandchildren. I want the company to be greener, but I know if I lose half a percentage of market share, my main stockholders will fire me and replace me with someone who only cares about market share. And exactly. so please, they'll tell me, please, when you, when you write, when you speak out there, t please tell people to send me emails, to send posts, tweets, whatever, and get their social networking circles. If, if I can get 100,000 messages that say, hey, I love your products, but I don't, I'm not going to buy them anymore until you pay your workers in Indonesia a fair wage or clean up the pollution you've caused. If, if I get 100,000 of these, I can take these to my main stockholders and, and say, hey, you know, we, we've got to listen to our, to our uh, to, we've got to listen to our customers. These are our customers. We've got to listen to them. And so I think it's so important that we keep sending this message, 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 message out there. Yeah, you're, you're, you're both absolutely right. But the other piece of that is that ultimately, if this is going to work, <clears throat> we've got to shift that power from money-centric transnational corporations to communities. And that our dominant institutions have to be organizing around communities and community well-being. And it requires, it's going to require some extraordinary institutional restructuring of both our, our institutions of government and, and business. Yeah. Uh, that have to go beyond just, uh, you know, depending on some well-meaning CEOs to make some different decisions. It's the whole deep structural change. Yeah. Perception, again, plays that big role. Yeah. Jeremy, we, we got another one? Yes. Andrew asks, can you speak to the evisceration of the middle class, people outside of corporate profits and the stock market? How do you address that sense of helplessness in our society? thinking too of recent demonstrations here in Portland, Seattle, et cetera, which reflects pent up frustration. Well, I would, I, I would answer that by saying, I, I think that, you know, it's it, the, 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 the pent up frustrations are now becoming more overt and it's being pushed by the, by the virus and especially uh, by the terrible police brutality that we've seen, the murders by, on the hands of police officers. But we are going through a, 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 a kind of a, con we're going through a consciousness revolution. I don't think there's any question about that. And that involves many of these actions. Whenever there's a revolution of any kind, there's always pushback. The authorities, the status quo doesn't want change to happen. And so they set in to stop it. But if the revolutionaries, or if we want to think of ourselves as agents of change, if we see that as being a confirmation that they're frightened, uh, the status quo is frightened, they're trying to stop us because we're making headway, we use that energy. And I think we're seeing that today uh, in, in many of these demonstrations. And I, I think we're seeing in, in Portland, for example, the tremendous resistance to the national police forces coming in and, and trying to take over a local situation. So, yeah, I, you know, I'm encouraged. Um, but I have to say I was, you know, in the 1960s, I was very deeply involved in the, um, in the integration movements, the anti-discrimination anti movements, as well as the anti-Vietnam movement. And we thought we had success. We got the Voting Rights Act passed. We got the Civil Rights Act passed. We got the Fair Housing Act passed. But we're back then now to where those laws, the changes in laws, weren't enough. Because we didn't realize that once we got all those things done, that was not the end. We had just put Band-Aids on the symptoms. That the real problem was our perception of success and economic success as being this short-term profit-driven, greed-driven model, uh, and which we've continued to have. And I believe that as long as we have that, it doesn't matter whether our corporations are completely owned by um, the employees or people of color or women or whatever, as long as the goal is to maximize short-term gains, regardless of the social and environmental costs, we're in trouble. And so we need to address that. I think people are beginning to understand that. And that's why, again, would you know, you know, and what David said about B corporations and benefit corporations and Black, BlackRock, all those things are true. But there is a change in consciousness 
behind all of what's going on there. Those things didn't happen before, they're happening now. And it's because there is this change of perception of consciousness, I think. David? Yeah, <clears throat> the, uh, you know, in a way it's very simple. <clears throat> as long as you focus on maximizing profits, you're talking about maximizing returns, <clears throat> financial returns to people who have money. So those are the already relatively wealthy. Right. You know, when we mentioned the, the middle class, it, it reminds me of, of my childhood. I grew up in the United States in which we really believed that we were a middle class society of the world, which is why we thought the rest of the world should emulate us because uh, this was, the land of equality. Um, now, <clears throat> we are no longer a middle class society. Now, of course, you know, there were always the groups that were, were excluded, but uh, the whole global situation now, the current statistic, at least the latest one I've seen, is that the world's richest 26 26 individual billionaires, their financial assets are equivalent to the total financial assets of the poorest half of the world's people. Wow. How far is that from a middle class world? Now, what this means is financially, um, we have got to have a massive redistribution of wealth. And I'm, you know, I'm not talking about income. I mean, uh, 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 we need major sh changes in income, but the fundamental issue is the participation in ownership of real assets. Now we have to rethink that too, but it, it also plays back to this police thing that one of the things that we've become, begun to get ever more increasingly aware of is the extent to which the whole institution of police and the role of the police was to keep slaves from escaping and to protect private property, um, you know, which is very different from, you know, main, maintaining basic peace and order for the well-being of the community. So it's all part of the deep rethinking that we, that, that we have to engage. Um, and, you know, again, we come back to, we've got to recognize that the purpose of the economy is to enhance well-being, our well-being as living people with living needs. And that requires a total rethinking of economics and restructuring of how we teach economics and think about both our human nature, our human purpose, and the nature and purpose of our defining institutions. Uh, no small challenge, um, but the first, the first step is the perception that we, we are not, you know, rather than seeing ourselves as financial beings whose well-being depends on increasing financial returns, recognizing that we are living, that we are living beings and our well-being depends on the mutual well-being of earth and of all the world's people joined together in an earth community. We got two questions. For a young student taking a gap year because of COVID, what do you recommend the young person do? And also, did your comment to the law student imply that you think young people should not have children? Should not have what? Ch children, I think that was directed to yes. me. Oh. About the law student. No, I, I certainly didn't didn't mean to uh, imply that. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I have a child, <laughs> and I know people that'll say I know some young people. I, that, in fact, one I'm very close to who says I don't want to have children. I want to bring them into this world. It's that's a very personal matter, and I wouldn't I wouldn't think of dictating that at all. I think what what I would say to the law student is don't have debt. <laughs> you know, try not you know avoid that debt no matter what. And even if that means you don't get that education, I, I, I just think the debt can put you into slavery. 
uh, it does put you into a form of, of servitude. Um, as far as the gap year is concerned, my, my advice personally would be follow your heart. Uh, if you take that year off, and, and I think it's a great thing to do, and I think especially now uh, that you can't go to school on campus and so forth, uh, there's so much you can learn in so many other ways. Uh, take, t you know, use it to follow your heart. I quit school uh, in the middle of my sophomore year as an English major at Middlebury College in Vermont. I quit, and I probably never would have gone back to school because I went to work for a newspaper I was writing. I, had a, I was really loving my life and, and loved being a journalist. But the Vietnam draft came after me. And one way to avoid the draft was to go back to school. So I went back to school uh, and uh, studied uh, economics. Um, but I think, I think taking time off is, is a great idea. And, and follow your heart. Just really listen to what you want to do. Why are you taking time off? So I once had a teacher who taught about freedom is good, but you don't look at it as freedom from. Look at it as freedom for. Uh, freedom for what? So, so you're free from school for what? What do you want to do with that time? Follow your heart. Really, really do it. If you want to be a carpenter, be a carpenter. If you want to be a writer, start writing. If you want to be a parent, have a child. If you don't want to be a parent, don't have a child. But really, really listen to what's inside. And I think listening to what is inside is truly listening to the voice of the universe. And it can be called God. It can be called the shamanic teaching, the guidance, whatever it is. But our hearts really are the vehicle to get us into a much deeper knowledge of, of who we are. You know, Einstein was an example of that when he when he when he talked about you know con conducting his thought experiments and 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 by thought he he was he was it was from the head but it was also coming very very deeply from the heart the two are connected. You know, John, we're of a rather different generation. Um, one of the things I've become very painfully aware of uh, watching our own children is how the opportunities have, have shifted. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I remember when, when I was back in, a, in graduating from, from, uh, from high school and then college, um, you know, there was never any question, will I be able to make a living? The question was, how do I want to spend my life? Uh, which is what the young person's question should be. But the situation has changed so much that very few young people have even the freedom to ask that question that, um, you know, we can't assume that any given young person has the choice of taking a year off. Um, you know, the, the desperation, and this is a function of this, this increase in inequality and the the shifting of the whole purpose of the economy from, you know, how do we create a, an economy that provides opportunities for all people um, from an economy that is only about, you know, can you find something to do that's going to make a, a rich person enough richer that they'll be willing to pay you a, a, a minimum wage that might allow you to uh, you know, run up a debt, but to, to feed yourself from day to day. So uh, to me, it's very much a, a mark of the, of the extraordinary dysfunction of the economy. And the fact that when we were growing up, we did not face these same absolute crises um, means it's not necessary. It doesn't have to be this way. It, it is possible, and we've we've got to change it so that there there is this kind of opportunity. In and, terms and, of a big, and a big difference, David, is that when we were growing up, we were taught, you know, you go to college, you get a degree, you go to work for a good corporation, you stay there, you keep working there, and you make a good living. I think today we're seeing a lot of uh, people realizing that that's not the route, that in some respects, entrepreneurism, uh, becoming a farmer, uh, becoming an organic farmer. I, 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 you know, I have a, was recently talking to someone who was a, a, a waitress in a restaurant, restaurants closed, and she thinks it'll always stay closed. She, she doesn't expect to go back to work as a waitress, and it was devastating to her because she loves doing that kind of stuff. But really what she loves doing is serving people and food. And so she's now started her own home delivery 
business out of her own kitchen. She's, she's cooking meals and she's focusing on, on a certain specialty of cooking and she's very, very successful. And I think it's a time when people can be very creative. Young people can be creative. Don't try to fall into the old system of thinking that you've got to wait for the rich guy to come along and give you a job. And in this period of, of high tech, we, we see so many, I know, I know so many people that have, I've been working with that have gone on trips with me, that have gone to workshops with me that are, that are using these new technologies and social networking to create things that I would never have even conceived of. So I think there are some opportunities here that are presenting themselves in a way the old system that you and I grew up with, Dave, yeah, it's not functional anymore. And the idea that you're gonna keep a job for the rest of your life, well, almost nobody does that anymore. Corporations don't keep people that long anymore for one thing, and people don't stay, they, they bounce around. So I think, there, I think that the, the, the devastation that you're describing is there. And I also think if people look creatively at this and really follow their hearts, they will find ways ways through that as indigenous cultures always have. That's my hope, <laughs> anyway. Yeah, well, the, I mean, the other side of that, I mean, I, <laughs> I, I grew up in a, uh, in a town with lots of local entrepreneurship and, you know, my dad had a retail business um, that I was destined to go back and as the eldest son to, uh, to, to spend, spend my life operating. Um, you know, I took a different course. My brother took over the business, but, you know, he ultimately shut it down because it's almost impossible to compete in the current corporate economy for, for, for young, for, you know, smaller businesses to survive. Well, it depends on what the business is in. So, you know, I've got friends that are, that are really, that are, that are doing a huge successful experiment with, with a blockchain where they're using blockchain in a particular way to help to help people communicate and do it in a way that gets things across where there's a tremendous integrity. And so as they move forward, if they understand that the, and the young people have these opportunities. So yeah, the old businesses don't work. It's just like Kodak didn't, you know, Kodak ultimately failed because they tried to stick to the old business. Kodak actually invented the digital camera back in, I think it was 1967, but they said, well, we, we don't want to introduce this to the public because we want to sell film. And as a result, Kodak, you know, Kodak basically has gone out of business. I mean, it doesn't compete with the people making the digital cameras. It couldn't, but it had the opportunity to do that. It just didn't do it. And I think that, so I think, yeah, the old businesses are dying, but there's a whole new opportunity here for incredible uh, new businesses to come along and, and, and maybe on a much smaller scale, maybe not. But so we may, this may be an area where, where we've got rather different perceptions of the current reality. Um, <laughs> well, that's good. It's good to have so, different perceptions. I mean, so, so many of these new technologies have, have actually facilitated the, the concentration of control. I mean, Amazon.com is a major, major uh, demonstration of that. Um, and, you know, it's, it's about if we're talking about this really deep re, rethinking and, and restructuring around, you know, what kinds of organizations, what kinds of businesses best serve a living community that is meeting its own needs with local resources and land and labor and so forth, uh, and that that is its purpose rather than consolidating control of the world's land and water resources and knowledge and so forth to feed the fortunes of billionaires. Um, it's a very different, uh, very different economic frame. Yeah, the person was asking the question: If she take, if he, he or she, I don't know which it was, takes that a year off from school, what do we recommend? And uh, I don't, I don't, I think yeah, if, if she's able to take the year off from school, that, that's great. Well, or, or these days. There's no school to go to often, you know. You, it, it, yeah. you know, by computer, but that's that's. that's well, my very, my very sense good. is that there are not very many young people that can, you know, simply ask that question. Well, why don't they just take a year off? And you know, you get the question: How are you going to feed yourself? How are you going to where are you going to house yourself, and so forth during that year? And my sense is that for many, many, many young people, that's an extremely difficult question to answer. Well, I'm not sure it's any easier to feed yourself when you're in school than when you're out of school. But anyway, let's 
I think we, we need to let's, well, yeah. let's, let's go beyond this. Let's go back to Jeremy. I don't know whether we've got time for any more questions. Yeah, it looks like we got time for one more. Um, so this one comes from Chase, who says, my goal currently is to work with youth and young adults on environmental, social, economic, racial, and climate justice issues and be advocates for their communities. What is your message to the youth and what curriculum and activities do you think could be most effective to get them to realize a need for a life economy? Well, again, I would say it's very, very, very difficult to uh, generalize that we have to go, I, I think it's what's important is for people to follow their bliss, to say, what do I wanna do for the rest of my life? Because I have known over my life way too many people that have not followed their bliss and some of them have taken on very, very good causes, environmental and social causes, and gotten burned out because they, they, they were doing it in a way that didn't suit their own lifestyle. I'm one of those people, actually. And what I found is that, you know, what I had avoided for many years was trying to make a living as a writer and, and a speaker, and because I didn't think I was possible. And I found that it not only is possible, but it's giving me much greater satisfaction than I ever had before. I don't make as much money but I'm much, much happier. So my advice would be, you know, that each individual has to look at how they fit into that. So when you're going out there, if, you're, if, you, if the, the, the person who asks the question is going to be working with such people and helping them understand, challenge each individual to really go into what she or he really wants to do. What are your passions and what are your skills? And how do you bring those passions and skills together in a way that serves the greater purpose? the social, the environmental issues, and so forth. You know, I've often thought, if we go back to the American Revolution, how lucky we are that George Washington didn't try to write pamphlets. <laughs> and, Tom, and Tom Paine didn't try to lead armies. You know, Paine wrote pamphlets, and Washington led armies. And Martha Washington organized women to make bullets and, and clothes for soldiers at the, uh, on the front line. They took very different paths. <laughs> they each followed, they did what their passions led them to do and what their skills led them to do. They took very different paths, but they headed for the same destination. Uh, that was getting rid of the East India Company, the, the rule of the British. Uh, and, and I think if today we all take our individual paths, we, we, but to really identify those, and that's why I outline this daily practice in, in touching the Jaguar, that takes us to each of us taking our individual path. And if we all head to the same destination, which is that life economy, we'll get there. But we have to enjoy the process. It's, it's important that we not burn out. And yes, there's discipline, like I love to write, but there's aspects of writing I don't particularly like, like that first critique I got from David Corton back in, <laughs> back in 2003 or 2004, whatever it was. That I, I didn't like that particular aspect. But as I got into it, I saw that it was very helpful. And I did like it. I liked what I, what I ended up doing as a result of it. It took discipline. <laughs> it took sitting down and doing something about it. And so I think that there is that aspect. But, but the important thing is to, to realize what, what are your passions and what are your skills and how do you bring them together in a way that will lead you toward a life economy? I'd throw in a rather different angle right at the moment in terms of what do we need to do right now. Um, I would urge them to get organized around the upcoming election <laughs> and the recognition that if we don't get an extraordinary shift in political leadership, uh, there's no hope for any of us on anything. Um, Excellent. That would, be, <laughs> that would be my immediate agenda. <laughs> yeah, great. Gentlemen, we're, we're so grateful to you both for joining us tonight. Um, if you haven't already done so, you can head over to the website at pals.com, pick up a copy of John's new book, Touching the Jaguar. Uh, John's other books are there, as well as David's books. Um, and John, David, thanks again. It was a pleasure to host you both. And we hope to see the rest of you at another one of our events soon. Great to be with you, Jeremy. And Thanks thank so you, Pals. And thank you, Jeremy. And thank you, Pals. Thank you, David. Thank you, everybody who's been on this. Yeah. It's really been fun. Yeah. Good night. Good night. Thanks.